Hello, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jonah from Discover, and today we are talking to Heather. Heather, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks, Jonah. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm super excited for this. I've been in video and audio media for a while. I know I was telling you before just how good your video looks. And also, for everyone here, if you're watching the replay or here in the live go check out fellow filmmaker on Instagram and on YouTube. You can immediately see just how high quality and delightful everything looks. It got me super stoked for this event. So uh, just to make sure everyone's in the right place, we are here to talk about how to create epic product ads at home. And this live workshop will share the five keys to a successful and professional product video. And a couple things to get out of the way. Feel free to hop in that chat, ask any questions, let us know where you're tuning in from. If you're watching the replay, hop in the comments, let us know where you're tuning in from, how you heard about Heather and fe fellow filmmaker, how you heard about Discover, something you're excited to learn, something you learn after the event. Just hop in there, we come back and read all of those comments and we love to hear it all. And if we don't answer your questions right away, I promise we're not ignoring you. We will have a Q&A after the presentation and we'll get to all those questions then. And if Heather is moving fast, I know she's got a lot she's packed in today. Or if the dog comes in the room, you have to go to the bathroom, don't fret. There's a replay available. It'll be here on the Discover event page on the YouTube the Discover YouTube, and it'll also be emailed to you along with the course offer, which we'll talk about a little later. Just want to call out really quick. We got Vincent from Indiana. He's been watching your channel for a while. Thanks for joining us, Vincent. We got James from Connecticut tuning in from Norway, uh, watching from Minnesota. I'm going to be in Minnesota in a week. I've heard it is cold, but I'm glad you're here all joining us today. This is going to be such a blast. Now, I don't want to take up any more time because I know you got a lot to show us today. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Heather. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm excited for this. I've been prepping for it for a little while. And uh, yeah, if you want to put the presentation up, I'll just get started. So like we've said, it's the five steps to creating epic ads at home or anywhere because that's like the absolute joy of product video is that you can do this pretty much anywhere. Now, I don't like wasting time. My style is to cut the fluff and just get right into it. So I just want to get into it. We're not going to do intros and stuff like that right now. Uh, Jonah already introed me, so let's put it that way. So I believe that if you're creating intentionally, you can create amazing work. Now, how do you create intentionally? Well, we're going to cover that. That's what some of these five steps are all about. But I don't know. Everything's just really exciting here. So let's get into it. So product video, there's a goal here. And the main goal is to be visually entertaining. Now, if you think about it, when you're coming across a video on TikTok, Instagram, you name it, you want it to catch your eye, you want it to be interesting. But second, and most importantly, is you want it to connect with you and to compel the audience, the viewer to do something. If it's not connecting and compelling and especially visually entertaining or interesting, um, it's not much of a video, especially a product video. Product video is a unique form and you need to do these things. So the biggest thing <laughs> is to make people care. It's something I say all the time. It's my approach to when I'm watching something, I'm basically saying, make me care about this thing that you're showing me. That I mean, I think all of us feel that way. Most audiences, most people coming across something, they're saying this in their head. They're saying, make me care. And unfortunately, you only have three to five seconds to make someone care. And that is not a very long time. It keeps getting shorter and shorter. Sometimes it's even less depending on the platform. So if you're making ads, doesn't matter if you're you know, making them home or professionally somewhere else, you only have so long to capture someone's attention. And the question is, how do you do that? How do you make someone care in the very short amount of time that you have? Now, most people are gonna tell you it's a secret and the truth is it is not a secret. OK, <laughs> I know it, it's like, ooh, secrets. Well, that's why I didn't say there were secrets here, because truly there are no secrets. This is something possible. And this is what it looks like. All right. And you might be wondering, well, that's that's really basic, Heather. And you're right. It is basic. Those are the five senses for the human being, I guess you could say. So that's sight, smell, taste, sound and touch. The five senses for a human. Humans use these senses to understand and interact with the world. In fact, we use these senses to better understand things 
that we're experiencing. So we experience something when we see, touch, taste, hear, and smell it. And therefore, we feel we come to understand it. So to give you an example so that it doesn't sound like a bunch of words. And also, I do know I move really fast. So once again, there is a replay if I'm moving way too quickly for you. But these five senses, here's an example. When you smell something, the differences between skunk spray and an apple pie, vastly different. And you're understanding them are so much more different because you, when you experience the smell of an apple pie, you have happy feelings, you have enjoyment, you have maybe mouthwatering type capabilities where you really want that. As soon as you smell it, you want that. You smell a skunk, you do not have any of those same reactions. You don't have any of those same emotions towards it. In fact, you really don't like it. You want to get away from it. And going back to this, how we better understand something is when we've experienced it, we feel like we know it. We know the difference between a skunk and an apple pie because we smelt it and one is very unpleasant and one is very pleasant. It's a very basic concept. Um, unfortunately, there is one missing from this little diagram. And you might be wondering, hmm, that sounds suspicious. That sounds a little crazy. It is a little crazy. The one that's missing is emotion, all right? And emotion is not a sense, let's be honest, um, but it's used as if it were one of our senses. And just to kind of show this to you in, in, in a way that might make more sense. Here's a quote from Robert Vallee. It says, the human heart feels things that the eye cannot see and knows what the mind cannot understand. I'm going to read it again, just so that it settles in. The human heart feels things that the eye cannot see and knows what the mind cannot understand. Uh, he was a psychology professor, so I assume he knows a thing or two about how our brains work. And I feel like this is very accurate to what we're talking about, that emotions compel, they connect, and they convince us to do all sorts of crazy things sometimes, good things and bad things. Emotions create urgency, they, they cause reactions, and sometimes help and sometimes don't help us to make decisions. So for instance, if somebody lives their life and makes a lot of decisions based off of fear, You've all made a, maybe heard of FOMO, the fear of missing out. That's what that stands for. When someone has that fear of missing out on something, whether it's a big sale, whether it's hanging out with friends or whatever it is, their emotions, when it's based in fear, are going to make them do something. Or for a better example, someone starts yelling at you. Maybe you have a disagreement over something. You're, they're screaming at you and saying maybe angry things at you. I'm pretty sure your emotions are going to flare up and you're going to react to that. All right. Emotions have that power over us to react and make decisions and cause a lot of urgency. Now, another way that emotions are working are to connect the dots for us. So we receive all this information from our five senses. When we see something, smell something, hear it, touch it. And I might have forgot the fifth one. But anyway, when we when we receive all this information, we still aren't solid on making our decisions, unfortunately. We use emotions to help us navigate that, connect some of the dots from things that we've experienced and understand to help us make decisions, all right? So emotions are very important and emotion drives each of the five steps to creating epic ads that I'm about to share with you. So it's really important that we understand emotion is the undercurrent. And I'm gonna show you how it's connected into each of these steps to really level up your epic ads that you can create from home and start doing this, all right? So step one, <laughs> effective pre-production. And this is probably something most people consider really boring, myself included, all right? Pre-production sounds really boring because it sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like you've got to, you know, sit there and write a lot of things out and figure things out. But it's an important step. And let me show you how that is. So good planning when it comes to pre-production is going to have effective results. You don't have a plan and a goal in mind. It's a really good chance that uh, you're going to miss any sort of mark because you don't even have a mark to hit in the first place. All right. So we need to have a good plan. Now I'm going to jump over and just tell you that resources for planning do not have to be confusing. Most people think they've got to have some sort of fancy way of doing this. There is no fancy secret. All right. I myself, love to grab a pen 
and piece of paper. So that might be your first go-to. That's my first go-to. And you just start jotting things down. I'm going to tell you what you're going to jot down in just a second. But that's what you're going to do. Start jotting things down there if you need to, want to, or you could do everything on pen and paper. I also like to take it from pen and paper, move it into my notes app or do some sort of sketching, maybe on my iPad or whatever. It depends on what's nearby, right? But then some free options here. Um, sometimes I use Canva. That's a, a place that you can use that's free. That's a great resource. And then there's Milanote. Both of these have free versions of these softwares that you can use to really organize uh, your pre-production process. So I personally have been lately trying out and using Milanote, their free kind of software. And it's actually been really great. It's very organized, has templates and stuff to use. So this has been really, this has just been really helpful for getting some effective pre-production. Now, there are four key stages of pre-production that you got to keep in mind. All right. And if you don't hit these, if you don't hit all of these, you might be missing a crucial step to having a video that performs well in the end, which we're going to travel through all of that today. All right. So of the four key stages of pre-production, the first one is data research. <laughs> Most people probably don't think of data research. Some might, some don't. I used to not think about it too much and it's so crucial, it's leading. So some of the things you might do in data research are finding the color palette, the branding behind the product you've picked out to make a video on or you're working with a client on, knowing the target audience. Who is that target audience? How old, how young, what do they say? What do they like? What do they don't like? The messaging, how, how do you formulate the words that uh, the target audience actually understands, agrees with, aligns with, and makes sense. All right, you gotta have all of these <laughs> figured out in the long run. So whether you're doing an ad just from something to get practice or whether you're working with a client, data research is integral. You need to keep it organized. Find the th top three colors that the brand use, put that in your data research area, organize it. Use one of these programs if you don't have one, all right? Second stage is inspiration. This is where you go and get ideas, unless you already have ideas, and then you jot your ideas down. You're thinking of visual effects that you can do, whether that's crazy transitions, or maybe that's just the actual, like what's taking place in the scene. Or there's design and props involved that you want to creatively work with, you've got a great idea about. And here's the thing with ideas. Some people think, oh, I don't have original ideas. Well, here's the thing. Original is not what you're going for. It's fine to copy and borrow from other people, but do it with style, do it with class. Don't just rip them off and, and do it exactly the way they do it. Take the principles, take some of the examples they have and use them and then put your own flair to them if you'd like. It might be better, but if you're in the learning process, don't worry about this too much, all right? So inspiration, stage two of pre-production. Stage three, storyboarding. Something that some people really are scared of because they think, I'm not an artist. I can't, I can't draw anything. Well, the point of a storyboard is that it's an organized visual representation of each shot in the video. So it's trying to give you like a little snapshot, a little picture, if you would, of just what you need. Like, where is the product sitting? What kind of camera movement maybe are you trying to do? What's the visual effect you're going for? Doesn't have to be perfect, but it's best to take that idea and put it on paper now. You're trying to do each shot. So opening shot. Sketch it out real quick. Do the next shots. Get the end shot. You're putting them in a row so that you can look at it and see where the gaps are, where it's not working with all the data research and inspiration you've already done. It has to have a good story to it, of course. So this helps you just to see it all. Gets a nice layout and an overview, right? That's storyboarding. And don't skip it. <laughs> Coming from experience, I've skipped it a long time ago. It's just, it's a bad idea. Don't do it. All right. Fourth one is a production list. This is pretty straightforward, but most people might not think to do it. Um, it's a list of all the needed supplies and gear. This could be anything, all right? It might be the props you need to get or the specific gear you're going to use. Write it down just to be sure that you don't forget to grab it in case, in case you're not doing it at home. Maybe you're going somewhere else for this one, or maybe you're going outside, who knows? All right, so those are the four key stages of pre-production. Now, pre-production, how it translates to what we've talked about before with emotion and our five senses is that pre-production focuses on the emotional side and the rational side. And I know that's not one of the senses here, but think about this. If something is just completely logical, 
people are not going to connect with it as much. There's no emotion in it. Therefore, there's no urgency. There's no connection. There's no reaction. You want people to do something after they've watched the video, most likely, especially if you're working with a client. You want them to do something, some sort of call to action. People are not going to get there just based on rationale or logic. There needs to be emotion. So I've said 50-50% here, but that's not always accurate. Maybe you're going to make a video that leans more heavy in the emotional side and less in the rational side. But the thing is, you need to have both. You need to have a good amount of both of these. Otherwise, it will not make sense logically and or will not connect if there's not enough emotion in it. So you need a little bit of both. All right. With pre-production, that's what you're hitting on. That's what you're going after. <laughs> uh, now, now we're going to talk about step two because we've covered pre-production. We have a good idea of what we're doing. We know where we're going, and that's really important. We can have more effective results. But lighting. Lighting is so important. It's often overlooked, unfortunately. Um, people don't understand that without light, you can't see anything. So let me tell you a quick story. I went cave spelunking a few years ago on vacation. I highly recommend it. It was so much fun. And we're in this pitch dark cave in the middle of this tunnel somewhere. And they said, hey, we want to show you all how dark it is. Turn your headlamps off. So we all turn our headlamps off. And we sit there in silence in this pitch dark cave, knowing that there are several areas where if you were to just walk around, you'd fall off into this cavern and basically die. Okay. So it's really scary. And they said, just turn off your lamps. And we did. And I cannot tell you how surprising it is that how dark it is in there. You put your hand in front of your face. You're doing this. You're like almost touching your eye and you can't see anything. And it's really off-putting. And the thing is, a camera sensor, the picture we're seeing right here is a camera sensor. A camera sensor works much like our own eyes. It's one job. One job is to interpret light. Without light, it's not really seeing anything. It doesn't have anything to show. In fact, this is what it looks like without light. This is what your camera sees without light. This is what your eye sees without light. All right? Proof, because I was in a cave. Um, but this is what it looks like with light. All right? With good light, of course. <laughs> We're going to get into this part. Good lighting. Because you could just take a light and shine it in a room, and you'll see stuff. But if you want, you know, things to look good, that's a different story. So let's get into that part, because good lighting can make a good product one that looks really cool, look better. Like, wow, right? Bad lighting can make a good product, the same product even, can make it look really boring or bad or gross, all right? So th this is the secret with lighting is that you need to know how to do the right things to get good results. Let me give you an example of good and bad lighting. Bad lighting on the left. <laughs> I don't know about you, that looks like cough syrup to me. Uh, it is kind of unappealing. And the one on the right, that's some good lighting going on there. All right. And the funny thing is that what's going on here is um, not that much different. It's just knowing how to use the light, where to place it, and the quality of that light. That's how you're going to get really good results with lighting. All right. It's placement, where you angle it at the product, and the quality. Quality refers to how hard, soft, bright or dim it is. That's quality. All right. So for instance, both of these have the same amount of lights. They both have two lights going on. They both have the exact same backlight. You can see the little, you know, shiny part on the edge there that it's pointing to. That's the backlight. Same exact one for both of these shots. But they're key lights. Key light is the main light lighting the source. That key light is different. The one on the left for the bad lighting example is using a hard light source. There's no diffusion, nothing softening it. So it's just very like, bam, at it. And it's just, that's not attractive. Also, it's distracting. If you notice how that line is cutting right through some of the information, we can't read it now. And then the light is so focused on hitting that product, it's just hitting it face on, that it's making it really flat. In the background, it just looks like mud. And then on the right side, we have the same exact backlight doing the same exact thing. So we got that one right, okay? But the key light is utterly different. This is what's going on with the key light, all right? It's a soft key light, so no hard light, no uh, hitting it hard. It's got soft key light. It's taking a, a very bright light source and diffusing it by putting a soft box on the light. And then I did double diffusion for this one. That is a shower curtain, 
All right. Dollar store shower curtain. You can do a lot with cheap stuff, by the way. Um, and that's that's putting even more diffusion before the light hits the product. So it's really soft. It looks beautiful. All right. And then the hard backlight for both of these was you can see it right there. It's got a snoot on it. That's like that little cone looking thing. And it has a little grid on it just to keep it really focused on the edge of the product. I didn't want it spilling all over the product just to remind you what it looks like. Okay. So they both have the same backlight, but totally different key lights. Um, in fact, key light makes the biggest difference here, as you can tell. Now, something about lighting. Lighting, it's job, I guess you could say, or one of its really cool qualities is that it's contrasting. It's creating contrasts. Contrasts are great. They can be really big contrast or really, you know, just subtle contrast. So bright versus dark, warm versus cool light, soft light, which we've just showed the example of versus hard light. All right. Flat lighting where you just shine the light straight face onto the product which sometimes is good, sometimes is bad. And then there's depth lighting, where instead of facing the light, you turn the light and bring it to the side. You get some shadows. That's what's happening on my face right here. You can see some shadows on this side, and then highlights are here. It's creating depth. Then you can do high and low contrast. So you could have, you know, the shadows be like ultra black. That's high contrast. And then low contrast would be this kind of soft effect that we got going on on my face here, if we're going to use this light for an example. Uh, it's creating a soft effect. It's not as harsh. All right. So that's what lighting is accomplishing. And effective lighting, or I should say purposeful lighting, <laughs> is really focusing on giving the audience the experience of sight, obviously, so they can see it, but also touch. And this might confuse people. You might be like, they can't use their touch senses at all if they're watching the video. While that might sound bizarre to put here, it's actually something people can do. It's that the visual interest, seeing it is giving them visual interest. They're entertained by it. And how they can touch it with lighting. Lighting causes dimension. It lets us know, well, where does that fall in 3D space? It gives us a 3D depth and understanding of the product. And it allows us to build like a little model of it in our head. And suddenly we can feel like we're I should say picking it up and examining it for ourselves. It's like online shopping when there's actually images of the product and they're good images. You're like, oh man, yeah, those are the exact dimensions. It looks like it's going to be the right shape and the right everything. It's perfect. And hopefully when you receive it, it's the right in the same exact way. So when there's good 3D depth going on with lighting and stuff like that, you're allowing the person to build the image and feel like they can touch it, which is part of the experience. If you can give them a good experience, giving them good purposeful lighting, they're going to feel like they've touched it and they've seen it. And seeing is feeling sometimes, all right? You got to see it and feel it at the same exact time. So that's what purposeful lighting is really working on. I would love to talk more about lighting. I'm so passionate about lighting. I talk about lighting so much on my channel. Lighting makes the biggest difference in any video, product video, or just this type of talking type of video, okay? So unfortunately, I can't talk more about it. We've got to keep going. I've already talked for quite a bit. Um, but if you want to, the YouTube channel is where you're going to find all that cool stuff, okay? Next step. Next step is creative formation. This one might sound like, oh, that could be fun or boring. Well, there's a lot that goes into the creative formation. Some people would just call this production. It is production, but this is like the fine points of production. So what's involved in creative formation is Composition, camera movement, product movement, moving the product in the frame, camera angle and the lens choice that you use. These all things, all these things come together and they make your image look good, look right. All right. Now we don't have time to hit all of these. I would love to. Obviously I do in the paid course, but we're going to hit on composition today. Uh, composition, let me just read this. Composition refers to how the elements on screen, this is actors, the scenery, props, product, and so on, appear in respect to each other and within the frame itself. That just sounds so complicated, doesn't it? So I'm going to boil this down and simplify it in terms that I would use. <laughs> Composition shows us what's important without distractions while making it all feel right to our mind, our eyes, in our heart, or our emotions. So when we look at something and you're like, oh, that just looks beautiful. That's perfect. It looks good. It's right. It's, ah, well, that's good composition going on right there. All right. So let's 
let's talk about how this is is working for us all right it's giving us composition good composition is giving us an ability to obviously see better and also you know touch it in our mind like we're 3d dimensions it allows us to see it like oh okay this makes sense because it's formatted properly i guess you could say but it allows us to feel it like i said just now where if it all feels right good composition when it feels right that's going to make sense in so many more areas than just to our eyes and our mind it's going to feel good here in the heart all right so that's where the five senses and emotion is working for creative formation now one of the ways for composition how we get uh really good at it i guess you could say is the rule of thirds and this is the most known or most common rule of composition you might have heard of it um the rule of thirds it's it's a compositional guideline i guess you could say so it's not necessarily a rule but we call it a rule and it breaks your image down using this little grid that you see on screen here these are horizontal and vertical lines creating thirds in the image all right and according to the rule <laughs> by positioning some of your elements or um in this case our product along one of the vertical or horizontal lines you'll end up with you'll end up with better composition and these dots you see those little yellow dots right there those represent what people would call a power point like a, a little area of power where if you place a specific part or point of interest onto these little dots you'll draw more attention to it. I know, sounds interesting, doesn't it? So <laughs> here's something that you need to know about the rule of thirds. We're gonna show a bunch of examples here in just one second, but here's something you need to know about any rule of composition. This is just one of them. This is the most common one, is that rules can be broken and you need to know when or how to break them and what to do when you break them. So I'm gonna show you that so that you can understand it because seeing, is feeling and understanding and knowing all right <laughs> we're gonna get into this so look at this shot first of all beautiful love it and we have the rule of thirds put over it in fact you can get the rule of thirds on your camera or if you have an external monitor to see your video feed through you could put one on there just so you can do this when you're live shooting this is one way you can use the rule of thirds is not to place the product on one of the lines, but to use it to center your product in the middle of the frame. Now, this is super common. You've probably seen this everywhere where people just take the product, plop it right in the middle and they go, bam, here's my shot. <laughs> Actually, correction. A lot of people will put it on a spinny table. I'm sure you've seen this. They put on a spinny table, the product in the center, that's the shot, isn't it amazing? And they do it from like 10 different angles. Unfortunately, that's not very creative, not very connective and not very interesting. It's not bad to do this, but in this image, as you can see, the product looks really small and insignificant. Look at all that space around it. It's called negative space and there's too much of it, honestly. It makes it feel really, I don't know, tiny and insignificant. But like if we just move the product, that's all we gotta do, move it forward closer to the camera. Suddenly we are showing that this product is important. It's very important. We stuck it right in the middle, even using our guides to know it's dead center and it's big, so to speak, but it's not taking up the whole frame. Here's the important thing to keep in mind. You see that little bit of space at the top of the cap and underneath the, the product in the frame, a little bit of space, that's good to have. Use of negative space is good, but too much of it is maybe distracting, all right? It's not a bad idea to do this, but you need to know why you're doing this, why you have all that negative space. Have a reason for it, all right? So being closer and being centered using the rule of thirds. But if we're following the rule of thirds, this is what the rule of thirds is going to do. They say, put it on one of the vertical lines. And if you line it up on the vertical and horizontal PowerPoint spots, well, you're going to have a really good composition. I don't know about you, but this does not look very good. <laughs> it looks fine. Don't get me wrong. It's a fine image. It's well lit and all that stuff, but it's very distracting having all of that extra space on the left side. It makes us go, why is that space there? And we end up looking at that background very closely and go, hmm, well, is, there, is there something there we're, we're supposed to see? Are we missing something? We are missing something. And that is called balance. Balance is another type of uh, composition. It involves arranging the positive elements and negative space in such a way that not one area of the design or overall shot is overpowering the other areas. So 
as of right now, we have too much negative space and it's really distracting. And just to be very clear, the moment you distract the audience for even a second, you lose them. They click off, they stop watching, they scroll past. All right. So this could be really detrimental. You've got to understand product videos are 5, 10, maybe 30 seconds sometimes. You don't have the ability. You, you just don't have that much to sacrifice. Okay. You can't sacrifice this. So if it comes down to negative space being the one thing that distracts somebody, that's bad. We don't want that. Look at all this negative space. What do we do with it? Well, our first thought might be to fill it with something. What do we fill it with? Well, we could throw another product in there of the same exact type, but then maybe that just doesn't make sense. Maybe we didn't want that. So we just take something else that we throw it there. We're like, ah, yes, look at this wooden bowl. Throw that in there. <laughs> it doesn't look terrible. Now we've got this negative face, uh, excuse me, negative space thing figured out. It's making a lot more sense because there's something at least there, but now it still makes no sense because we have no context for why that wooden bowl is there. And this, this just naturally leads us to step four. That's visual storytelling. This is my favorite thing to do. All right, so let's get into this one. Visual storytelling. Okay, so currently right now our shot is this. We've fixed the negative space. It's composed and balanced. Check. Um, as far as emotionally driven, no. As far as making any logical sense or having any context, no. It's just a wooden bowl sitting there. And unfortunately <laughs> that's confusing and when we confuse people that's just not gonna work you know they're gonna they're gonna check out real quick so what we're going to do how we drive emotion and make sense of this filling up negative space is using something that i like to call emotional elements emotional elements let me give you some examples so water drops water drops on a product can show that it's a cold uh, beverage maybe and it's cond uh, condensations gathering because the room is warm and the, the drink is cold now we know that that thing is cold we could use fog or smoke to kind of give an idea of, of maybe the environment or just kind of a mood or like it's emotional tying right there and or an effect that shows that something is hot or something is cold we can use food accents uh, maybe something's made out of almonds or some, some some sort of other thing, fruit or whatever. We can use these elements that we find, mint leaves, floral, food, you name it. We can bring these elements in and suddenly it can make more sense, emotionally speaking, when we look at something. I'll show you in just a second. And then there's also material textures. Textures are a wonderful thing to include, especially when you've got really good lighting going on. Because what happens is people can look at those textures and get an idea of like, oh my, there's so many things going on. You know when you can feel something that, I don't know if you're a texture person, you feel it and you're like, oh, this just feels so silky smooth. If it's a ribbon or if it's rough, you're like, oh, you get different emotions when you feel something. So as much as we can bring these um, elements in, whether they're textures or condensation, fog, smoke, food, fruit, floral, whatever it is you can think of, these are just some examples. It can make a lot more sense of something because the emotional elements, how they're relating to the senses and emotion is trying to connect people to their taste buds and to their sense of smell. And these two things are going to make you feel a lot of emotions. I don't know if you've ever seen a video or whatever where maybe they're showing somebody reacting to like a super sour ball or a lemon or something like that. And they kind of like make this face and you're like, oh my gosh, I could just imagine it. And your mouth starts watering. Or some people are really good where uh, they smell something when they see it or they smell it when they smell it. Uh, you walk by a bakery. I guarantee that you're probably like most people. If you smell cinnamon buns, fresh cinnamon rolls come out of the oven from that bakery and they're just wafting out. You might not have been hungry, but suddenly you're like, I just really want cinnamon rolls or cinnamon, like apple pie. So, like we talked about apple pie already. Okay. The sense of smell and the sense of taste are so powerful. I sometimes can smell what my great grandmother's house smelled like. And it just brings back so many memories. And memories are a direct link to our emotions. All right. Something smells like grandma. <laughs> you know, maybe you like it and maybe you want it. I don't know what that might be. I think it was laundry soap, to be quite honest. That's a side note. So going back to our example, we fill negative space. We're doing good things. Let's use emotional elements. Let's let's tie this thing together. Let's start making some sense of it, at least, so that it looks a lot better than it currently is. So let's add 
oh, a food, a dish. Let's make a dish out of this because granola, blueberries, maybe some mint leaves for effect of color, <laughs> or maybe people like to taste. We can imagine this being made with this honey. Suddenly, not only do we just have a product, but we have an understanding of what this product can be used for, what can be done with it. And now we have something to look at that's like texture heaven and it's like taste bud savory and mm, it's just good. Okay. And the shot just looks really balanced now because the bowl has meaning. It has purpose. It has context now. Now it's not just some weird thing just sitting there. Now it's like, oh, this makes total sense. This is somebody about ready to make a meal or they just made it and they just happen to be really good at taking a picture. Well, in this case, it's a video, but you know, the idea is there and we can even go a step further. We could do this, all right? The scattering <laughs> of a messy person. This is probably what most of us would look like if we made something. There's gonna be granola everywhere, blueberries everywhere. And just think about this in a video context where maybe those blueberries are rolling into the frame as you're pushing in on the shot and the product moves in or they're falling down and they're kind of crumbling as they, they hit the countertop or whatever. You can get really creative with this because what these emotional elements are doing are is giving us something to connect with. And in this case, in particular, it's food. People are really good at craving food and you can make them care, but you could also make them crave. And craving is a highly emotionally driven thing. And honestly, it just looks really good. Now, there is one problem here. We can suddenly have so many emotional elements, all right? Say we went overboard. Say we put a spoon in there and we we brought in a, a plant and we threw other things in the background. And we just filled this frame. Suddenly we have way too much going on compositionally. It's just too much to take. Visually, we don't know what we're looking at anymore. Suddenly we've lost our perspective. Maybe we're not we're not talking about honey anymore. Maybe we're talking about just someone's messy kitchen. Even if it's good lighting or even if it's good composition, it's still just too much. So something to remember is that you, you want these emotional elements, but more is not better. Less is sometimes more in this case. You don't want to take the focus off of the product. The emotional elements are there to help, to connect, and to help people see better, understand it, and feel it emotionally but you don't want to overdo it. Like we said before at the start, if there's too much emotion and there's not much rational or connection in that sense, and that department of it just looks and feels and makes sense over here, then it's imbalanced. And we're striving to make things balanced. Okay. So look at this. We're right on time. I'm, I'm excited for this. We've got one more step. I feel like I've just powered through this. I'm hoping y'all, hoping y'all enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Uh, step five. Powerful editing. It's the final step. Some people are really good at editing. Some people maybe not. And editing comes down to your program. Now, of course, these are the three most common ones. Maybe you already have one. Probably a pro at editing. I don't know. You can let me know. <laughs> but there's Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve, and Premiere Pro. These are common ones. I mean, there's plenty of other ones out there, basic and very advanced too. But for the most part, which one you're choosing is going to help you do some pretty cool things when it comes to product video. And I will explain this real quick. But first, this is what it looks like just to have these. All right. Final Cut Pro is Apple only. It works on Macs only. It's a $300 one-time payment. Okay. That's fine. DaVinci Resolve is free. There is a paid version, but it pretty much has the same exact things as the free version. And it works on both Macs and PCs. So that's great. Then we have Premiere Pro, which can work on Mac or PC. Um, and it's $240, but annually. You got to pay every single year for it. The reason why I bring this up is because you might look at them being like, okay, maybe they're all equal. Well, clearly they're not all equal. But secondly, Final Cut is... Is a, is a Mac only, is an Apple product. So it's more simplified and user-friendly and it has some advanced features, but definitely not all of them that DaVinci and Premiere Pro have, all right? You can definitely make some great stuff in it. I'm a 10-year veteran of Final Cut Pro. And I love it. However, it doesn't do everything I need. I actually use DaVinci Resolve to do a lot of my product video stuff, not only because I shoot on a 6K Pro over there and that's the editing program for it, but because it's really powerful for color and it's powerful for wire removal and other such amazing advanced features that you can do that Final Cut doesn't have. And Premiere Pro actually has some of these as well. Unfortunately, you got to pay annually and some people have issues with it crashing all the time. So the only reason why I bring this up is that if you're going to take this next and final and most important step 
um, it's important to know what you're getting into and which one you're going with. All right. So just so you know, those are the two I use. I try to stay away from Premiere. Um, but what's going into an edit? So you've got your program picked out. Maybe you're become a veteran at it. Maybe you're just new. But what goes into it is color correction, color grading, visual effects. So that's like light leaks or transitions and stuff that you're doing, music and sound design. These are the main things you're going to do in an edit. There may or may not be more. It just depends on what type of work you're working with. Um, product video has all of these involved. And unfortunately, I cannot dive into all of these because we are going to miss out on our Q&A in just a minute. So I want to make sure we get to questions that you all have been putting in here. So hang tight. Um, but what I'm going to cover really quickly is just how this is connecting to our five senses, excuse me, and to the emotions that we have. So powerful editing is focusing on, of course, letting people see it. That's you know, what editing is really best at is bringing it visually all together, making it look epic and be cool. And which, of course, connects us to how we might feel about it. But more so, it's giving us a hearing experience, allowing us to hear and feel emotion that way. And the way that we're going to connect feelings when it comes to editing beyond the visual is through music and sound design. All right. So most people think to add music. There's plenty of places you can go to get music free and or you pay for it, which never, ever pl plagiarize. OK, <laughs> but. The power behind adding music and sound design is this. Music is evoking emotions, all right? Sound design is immersing the audience. So music, there's genres to choose from, all right? Different genres have totally different emotional feelings to it. Some are happy, some are more thoughtful, some are moody, epic feelings, cinematic. You know, they're like things that you're just going to feel totally different on. There's beats per minute or just you know, how fast something moves, the speed or just the overall mood and context, the instruments they use, if there's lyrics or no lyrics. Music is going to bring a really big emotional tie and pull to whatever it is you're telling. It's basically telling somebody how to feel about what you're showing them. And then there's sound design. Sound design is often overlooked. And it's actually very, very important in product video specifically because sound design is immersing them, yes. And let me give you an example, okay? There's um, there's plenty of people out there who are car nerds, all right? They're really into different types of vehicles. And when they hear an engine start up for whatever vehicle it might be, they can tell you exactly the year, the model, the everything about it, just because they know how the engine sounds. It is connecting with them. They know. They understand now. They're feeling whatever it is that they feel when they hear that particular engine. And the same thing goes with any sound design you can add. It's allowing the person to not only be immersed in what you're showing them, but to connect them to it. They go, oh, I know that sound. Or, ooh, this one's interesting. I don't know what that was. Let me give you some examples of sound design, all right? So here on the left, we have a bag of chips. Some of the sound design that we can put in the edit. So sound effects, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Technically, it's sound design. You record them or you go find them from some site. For chips, you might get the crackling of the plastic bag, the snapping of a chip. Maybe it breaks while you know that's something you're doing your video or the crunch, someone biting it. All right. These are all sounds that when they're there, it immerses us. It just feels right when they're not there feels like something's missing. It doesn't matter if you have the best music in the world. Without the sound effect, without sound design, it's lost. It just doesn't connect as well. Same thing for the one on the right. It's it's chocolate milk. So we could do pouring liquid. You could do the glass being set down. Or maybe if the cap makes a noise or you can have it make a noise. Sometimes something doesn't actually make a noise in real life, but it we want it to have like a sound. So you know how whoosh effects for transitions are very popular? Technically, that wouldn't normally maybe make a noise, but you can do a little a whip sort of sound or a whoosh sort of sound. All right. There's <laughs> there's a lot of things you can do that aren't actual sounds you'll hear, but it's a great place to start from with what you'll actually hear. Just another example real quick. We have a chocolate bar. You could do the whole wrapper tearing off. You can have ambient noise. You could do the chocolate bar maybe snapping in half if you show that. Um, the one on the right, it's a, it's a fizzy health sort of drink. And so what you can kind of like, I'll say visualize in your head is like, well, there's a lot of things we could do. There's, <laughs> I got a lot of fog coming out of the back of this, back of this one. Actually, it's a smoke grenade. Um, but you could do the whole, 
of when the can opens and then you can do the do, 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 when the like the liquid's coming out and pouring into some sort of can i'm not very good at sound effects with my mouth obviously uh, you could also do the fizz sort of sound and get that going um, there's just a lot of things that you can do to immerse people and that's what you're doing with sound design that's the important part of editing and that's how you make it powerful that's how you take everything you did in pre-production all the work you put into your lighting, making it purposeful and driven, emotionally connecting people in composition, and then taking the time to add emotional elements. It's all lost if you can't fight, figure out how to connect and make that one final piece work, which is the powerful edit, getting the edit to come together. It's important. I would love to actually let you listen to these because that would just make more sense of it for you. Um, so actually, they're on my website, uh, fellowfilmmakercourses.com. They're right at the top there. You see that little image? See those two icons? That's the chocolate bar one, and that's the health fizzy drink. And those are just two things you could go listen to afterwards. Um, that way you can hear it for yourself. Just like, oh, yeah, music is great. But like when there's just a little bit of those, those sound effects in there, sound design, they do not need to be loud. Don't overdo it. <laughs> just nice and subtle. Make it, make it connect. That's most important. All right. So those are the five steps to creating epic ads at home or anywhere. And I say that because you don't need fancy stuff. I showed you how just a shower curtain with lighting is powerful. You can do this in your home. It's what I've been doing and have done and do do. I, you could take it other places. You could do it in your office. I do it in my office. Okay. So it goes anywhere. And this concludes our, our little presentation. We're going to jump right into some Q and A, but if you want to learn more about the course that I have, which is product video pro, it's going to teach you how to be a professional in shooting product video. So everything I wasn't able to show you and answer today, because there's so many questions and so many little areas where you're like, what, how do I do this? Oh, I need some inspiration. That's what the course is about. It's teaching you, bringing you to a professional level, whether you know nothing or whether you know something, there's something to learn there. So check it out. That's the website right there. Or you can just connect with me. If you've got questions, you're always welcome to reach out. I love helping people. It's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we're ready to get some Q&A here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Heather. I, I'm sure your course goes further into the details of everything, but also I just appreciate how much you covered <laughs> in, the, in the 40 minutes. You really covered everything. And your distinction as someone, audio engineer and sound designer, I love the distinction between yes. music and sound design. I feel like when you're starting out, you get a little lost thinking music covers it all. Yeah. And you don't really realize how, <laughs> how wrapped up. So everyone who's watching, please, you're already doing it, but drop your questions into the comments. We'll get to those. And I know it takes a second for those to roll in. So I, I wanted to start with a question myself, sure. although first wanted to say the course, the links for the course are in the comments. They're also in the description and awesome. there's a little bit of a discount there for a week. So hop on that. Um, and that'll be valid through the replay if you're watching the replay, but a week from when it went live is when that goes away. Yep. That said, I know it can feel like when you're getting into video and audio, there's, if you go to your Instagram, right, you have all these awesome fancy lights and cool stuff <laughs> and, and it can feel like there's a high entry level, but what I loved you showing today were some of the skills you can develop like before having any of that. Do you have any advice, like if you really want to get into this, but you're saving money to invest in like a good camera because, you know, you want that or in lighting, like what are some yeah. things you can practice right away just like to get an, a grasp on this? Can you practice yeah. with your phone? Like what's the what's a good method? Yeah, definitely. So first of all, yeah, you don't need to wait to have the perfect gear because I'll tell you from experience, if you sit there waiting, uh, you're never going to start. So Yes, you can do it with your phone. Um, you can just whip it out. You can get an app if you want for it or just use the the one that comes with your phone and you can actually start shooting. I would say the, the best way to get into this is use what you have. So if you do have a camera and a lens, great. You know, if you know how to use it, that's awesome. Um, but if you have just a phone, that's a great place to start. But I would say there's one piece of gear that you just ultimately should get and just at least get one good light. Right. What I mean by a good light is you can go grab, I always recommend the Godox SL60W just because it's it's cheap, but also Aperture just has one as well. So there's links in all my website stuff. But point being, you get a 60 watt light with a diffusion, like a soft box, or you can use a shower curtain for Pete's sake. Like you could go <laughs> ultra cheap. Those just those two things, 
one good key light makes the biggest difference. So in this, what I was just showing you today, there was a few shots where there's chocolate milk. I did that with all just one light. It was an SL60W mm. and just some soft diffusion. And I got some really great stuff in it. I still love some of the shots there. And that's when I was just first starting out. I used them in this example because you don't have to have everything. You can just start. And that's the point. Right. So yes, totally grab your phone. If you have a camera or whatever, use it. And most of all, you should be leveling up your skills. So learn how to use what you have to its best ability. Like it might be limited, but push it. That's how creativity really, <laughs> <Right>. really starts. <laughs> yeah. And so key light is like primary. Yes. and best. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then you want it yeah. soft typically with product video. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but soft light is going to go a lot further, whether that's overhead, angled, or even if you want to go flat. Uh, just straight on. That's that's fine. But you want something really good. Key light allows you to see it. Like once again, you need to be able to see it. The, right. the biggest mistake right. I see in product video is people don't have enough light and it's not used well. It's just kind of like they look like they grab a lamp and they just kind of point it at it. And you're like, well, that's not that's not really helping us see it and feel it much more. So a good key light goes a long way, levels up your filmmaking instantly. Love it. Love it. Uh, we're getting a bunch of questions in here, Sweet. so I just want to hop in. Uh, okay. Niovadin, I, I don't know how to say the name or username, but is asking, <laughs> do you have any sound design courses you would recommend? Um, I've been meaning to get more into the audio side of things for my projects. Also, do you cover audio in depth in your course? Do you touch on it? Like, yeah, for yeah. your own course and others. What sure, like. sure. As far as others go, um, I don't, I can't think of one off the top of my head that specifically goes to like how to do sound design in editing. Um, but I do know one that like covers it from like start to finish, I guess you could say as a general whole, as it, apply, as it applies to like all filmmakers. So not product video specifically. Um, it's called That Audio Guy. His name's, I believe, Brendan, by the way. Uh, I've, it's just the one I've heard of. I know a lot of people go to him and it's considered a really great. So that one's kind of like an all around go to. Uh, so you can look him up on YouTube or online. Mm -hmm. um, as far as in my course in particular, I do have a video in there about just how to record your own. And then in the editing section, I go over how I do my edits from start to finish. You get examples, you get walkthroughs. And of course, I'm always updating and adding to the course. So I actually have plans very soon to put some more audio in there so that people can get better understanding on it because it, it is really important. Right. Makes it. Yeah. That's the emotional part, right? That's yeah. Really good. Yeah. Love it. Uh, here's a good question from James Williams, which is also interesting. Yeah. It's specific mm -hmm. to what product you're shooting. My products are larger clothing and it's hard to get a good depth of field or fit everything in my small space. Would you recommend shooting the videos outside? It's a pain to move the lights. Like how do you work around a small space with big products? Yeah, that one is really, really hard. I've run into that a few times where you're like, oh, what do I do here? I'd say there's there's two ways you could go. You could just take it outside. It's obviously not convenient sometimes because weather will always be a concern and an issue. So if you know somebody who has a bigger space that you could just borrow. I've done that before. I make friends with photographers, honestly. They have studios usually. And if you're really good friends with them, they might let you rent it or just borrow it for the day. I've done that before. Or if you got family or friends that maybe have like a garage or something like that, something a lot larger that you could set up a nice background in or whatever, um, that might be a good option as well. But outside is maybe the most efficient and I'll say cheap alternative. Um, it's just, it's a little tricky uh, with your gear and or time of day. So those are right. the only two other ways I can think of it. That's what I've done. If you're going to someone's studio for time, do you like do a demo at home <laughs> yes. to work that out. So oh, yes, you know. ultimately. Yeah, I, I test everything if I can. Like if I'm going to do something new that I've never done before, uh, an effect or a transition piece or just an epic shot, um, and if I was going to take it somewhere else, I would do it at home as best I could if I can, you know, smallerize it and mm -hmm. or just test it as a whole, whether it's not supposed to look perfect. It's just supposed to give me an idea. Then right. yeah, I'll do that because I there's nothing worse than showing up and being unprofessional in someone else's space and taking up their time and space. So better to right. test it. Love it. Uh, Beth has an interesting question. Uh, how would you approach selling artwork in the process of making that? I, I assume making product videos of artwork. Okay, okay. Uh, that's how mm. I'm interpreting it. Beth, let how me know otherwise. But since we're... Yeah, that yeah. one could be interesting. I personally haven't... I haven't touched that area yet, but I would imagine that 
if you're working with an artist and it's not your own work, for instance, um, you're going to want to be really connected with them and the message that they're trying to tell. So you could come out into it with your own ideas, but uh, at the same time, if they're your client, you want to be on the same page. And that's why pre-production is really helpful to be mm. connected with them. So when you're doing a plan and you've got a proof of concept, you want to be running it by them. Um, as far as like selling, um, like if it, how would you approach selling artwork? the process of making that. I mean, if you're doing this yourself, it's your own art. Um, granted, you have full control over how it looks and what you're doing with it. If it just comes down to the skill sets of how to get it to sell, like that's what you're trying to make the product video for, that's a lot of market research on your end. That's the pre-production phase. That's even just working on your business marketing skills and skill sets and whatnot. Um, it might be hiring somebody, honestly, to advise you on like what works best because you could think, oh, I'll start a YouTube channel. And that might not be the best way to approach it. You might be looking at doing paid ads on Instagram because maybe that's where a lot of people who are into art are at. And at that, at that point, you know your audience, hopefully, pre-production phase, and you can start creating a, a concept around who you're trying to reach and what you want them to do. And then the product video gets easier from there. That's why pre-production is really important. And that that's how you would start. You'd start with where your business is at or the business you're helping out making a video for. And then you start working on the pre-production, making sure it fits, aligns, and reaches the audience. Right. You're doing yourself such a favor to do that work oh, yeah. up front, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, love it. Okay. Uh, Siri is asking, what is a good entry-level mic? This is an interesting one. I'm a chef, so I can't decide if a lav mic or a podcast mic would work better. Uh, I assume you also mean, Siri, let us know in the chat, like you're moving around in your videos? interesting so trying to decide yeah yeah this question more, more or less is sounds a little more like in the general sense rather than product video because more or less with product video the only time you're whipping out a microphone um is if you're doing um like an infomercial type of product video and i covered okay. the differences between uh, a product video that focuses on a product and then a product video that falls into more commercial line of work. There's a big difference between the two. One's more social media ad friendly. One's more like TV commercial, you know, like Super Bowl kind of stuff, which right. personally, I love both. <laughs> and um, so when it comes to like what microphone you're going to choose, it's very different as far as like a product video ad social media type concept. You might only pull out a microphone if the product you have makes very interesting and specific sounds to that product that you want to keep realistic to it. And in that case, you pull out a, a good shotgun microphone. I've even used a lav microphone. So like a good cheap option that I recommend is called the Tascam DR10L. It's mm -hmm. just a little recorder and a microphone that comes with it. And it's just a great way to get started if you don't want to go out and buy a bunch of stuff. It's like 200 bucks. It's a good mic and it's a good recorder. So it's doing you two favors at once. Um, so that's what I would recommend as far as like if you're doing it from a product video perspective. And then if you're going into commercial work, you're better off hiring somebody if you've got the budget for it because they're going to do a way better job than you can. But if not, you're probably going to want another type of condenser or shotgun microphone is what it's called. The podcaster mic is for really podcasting. It's like this. This is kind of like a podcast one. It sits on a desk or it attaches to a desk and it's not really meant for anything else. They're just fancy things <laughs> really for good vocal quality, but only for podcasts. They really don't work in any other context. Well, no. And if you get up and walk away from that mic, like you're going to. Right. You've got one lose. right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <exactly. laughs> yeah. So the uh, Siri, I think, yeah, if you're, I think I, oh, you did specify. Yes. Okay. So I think you're shooting yourself. So you're walking around. Um, then a lav yeah, mic. So, yeah. Go yeah. with a good lav mic. Yeah. A, an even cheaper option that I like is the Power DeWise lav mic. It's super mm -hmm. cheap, 30 bucks off Amazon. Once again, I have links to my gear that I use in particular over on my website, the fellow filmmaker courses.com. So it's really easy to find all the gear. A lot of people have questions about gear, and I do cover that also in my course just because it's a really big part of usually what you're getting into for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another gear question coming in. Sure. Uh, Imogen is asking most advice centers on camera. However, it's been my experience that the lens is more affecting, like what about lens selection? Yeah. Do you have any advice on, on that or like yeah. which to invest in first? Yes. Your opinion, <laughs> I, I get that. So yeah, most people, um, YouTubers will really focus on the camera, but the camera is really, it's important, but not the most important. So yes, the glass, the lenses are more important than the camera 
if you already have a good camera, you don't need to keep upgrading it. It's the lenses that you're going to want to look at investing in because good glass allows you to see everything just like a million times better. Once you have good glass, yeah, it just makes a big difference. Um, I will equally just input because I'm a big advocate for it is that lighting makes the bigger difference. You can have the mm. best camera and the best lens, but if we're not getting a good image from what we can actually see in real life and then also through the camera, it's not going to really matter if you shot it on a red weapon with like the, the cookie lenses and stuff like that. Like nobody cares. Nobody cares what you right. shot it on if it looks like trash. <laughs> right. I love that. I always think of those like iPhone, like shot on iPhone commercials. If you look up the like behind the scenes, they're <laughs> It's packed with lights. Everything yes. is so well Everything lit. is so about like, lights, especially yeah. the smaller the sensor. My goodness, you need to be really good at lights. Like I, I've done, you know, live streaming. I've done, you know, uh, what do you call them? Zoom calls and stuff like that mm -hmm. where all I was using was like a webcam. But if you got good lights, I would get compliments all the time being like, wow, your stuff looks so good. And I'm like, yeah, it's just a webcam. You know, it's just the lighting. It's the lighting that makes a big difference. Like, so, yeah, it's it's. Yeah. It's key. And I know the question was really specific to like what lens in particular or whatever. Um, it's kind of hard because it depends on your camera. But like I personally am shooting shooting on Canon and or Blackmagic with EF lenses and or um, if I want to get other lenses, then I put them on there as well. So like Sigma, Canon, that's kind of my go-to right now. Nothing special. You don't need to have the most expensive stuff. You can really make amazing things with, I'll call them mediocre or budget-friendly things. Do you have a advice for like selecting a lens size, like what millimeter okay, you yeah, want yeah, to yeah. use? That's a good point. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. So in product video, it's not as uh, like, I want to say obvious. I mean, it is obvious when you go to the extremes of a wide angle lens, like a super wide angle versus a more telephoto, like uptight, close and personal type lens. You'll see the differences, but it's not the same effect you get with a human face. So if you have a human in it, of course, it makes a lot of sense. But I prefer to shoot right around 35 millimeters. It just looks really good. It's nice and clean. It's not too wide, so it doesn't start distorting it. But it's also not too, I want to call it usually a telephoto makes something look a little bit more chubby and it can do that to a product sometimes. So sometimes I like to keep it more accurate to life. And so somewhere around 35, 50 is a pretty good range. Sometimes I go down to like 24 uh, millimeters just because why not? I need the extra space for whatever reason. I'm in tight spaces a lot of time. Right. That's why I was wondering because if yeah. you're in your basement or something, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 24, 35 is great. I wouldn't go much lower than like 20, maybe mm -hmm. 18 at most, just because uh, you'll start getting a little too much distortion around the edges. And also with just the product itself, it just, eh, you'll be pushing it. That's all. Yeah. Well, awesome. we have to wrap up just for time, but Heather, thank you so much. It's been a blast. Thank Certainly. you everyone for your questions, Heather. Thank you for asking them all. And once more, where should, if people want to find you, ask you questions, I know YouTube at fellow filmmaker, right? Is a good resource. Yeah. It's a great resource. Are you active on Instagram or what's the best place? Definitely. To yeah. It's, to Instagram's a great place to go. I'm, I've also got Facebook. Um, and you know, ultimately there's a contact form on my website. So if you got really specific questions that goes right to my email, I see that I answer it. So those are the best ways to contact me. Website, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, they're all there. Go to the website, no. you'll find everything. <laughs> <laughs> find me everywhere. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you again, everyone for watching. Please hop in the chat, show your yeah. appreciation for Heather. If you're watching the replay, hop in the comments, let us know something you learned, something you're excited to do with this new knowledge. And if you enjoyed your time here, please like, and subscribe to the Discover channel, trying to bring more creators, entrepreneurs, creatives like Heather out here to share and help us all get better at all these many things we're tackling in life. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. We'll yeah. see you around, Heather. It's been all a blast. Right. Thank you so much, Jonah. See you later.